question we will ask is, uh, can a machine be intelligent? Uh, maybe, perhaps. I would like to, but uh, not too much intelligent because I'm also a square about robots. Uh, at now, intelligence is more in the engineer's head. If you want more complex dynamics, if you want a new task to make by the robot, well, you have no choice. You have to encode it. You have to program it with algorithm. And algorithm can be really complex. And the more you add this task inside the system, the more it's complex. So it's really difficult to, go, to get some autonomous robots and to deal with uncertainty and unpredictability. The more you want something intelligent, the more you want something autonomous, well, you have to understand more about human intelligence. You have to understand the design principles of human and uh, biological cognition, and therefore, you need to check what are these kind of design principles. So let me introduce you the most intelligent learning system on Earth, infants. Infants from very early in life, at birth, can understand faces, faces of other people, and they can do some imitation. So the thing is, they never see a face in their life. They don't know what is a face. They never see their own face. But they can do some imitation about someone else understanding the intention of others and linking what they see with their own body dynamics. When they look at facial patterns, well, they understand that they can learn from it social interaction. They can understand the eye gaze, the posture of the face, the displacement of the facial expression, emotion. They can learn a lot of things. And they understand that even if it's three dots, they can have something quite interesting from it. When they look at a TV set, a TV that they never see in their life, they can see their own most shown through this TV set. Well, they can understand where is their body. They can understand when. When they are moving, it is their own body. So they have somehow a knowledge about self-consciousness or self-awareness. They know where their body is. So from this, they can somehow create a beginning of intelligence. And next, when they see someone else uh, grasping a complicated toy and playing with it and learning some sequential action, they can learn by observation. And when they can learn by observation, when we give a toy, they can replicate this complex sequential order to make the toy complete. So the question from a roboticist, uh, is it something innate or acquired? Is there a completely different tasks are completely separated, or are they linked somehow? If, it's, uh, if they are completely separated, well, the problem is, uh, we, as an engineer, you have to code all the tasks. And in the new situation, you have to code this new situation. Instead, if they are linked together, if there is a design principle behind it, well, if there is some acquirement and development through, through about this cognition, well, we can perhaps find the design principle behind it and to give it to the robots. So the key message I would like to, for you to understand today is that first, one of the design principles is that intelligence comes from the body. When you are doing some random motion, about a toy, doing a really noisy toy, even random, you are linking information from your visual information, auditory information, and motor information. This information is synchronized, and we call this synchronization multimodal integration. Because there is a link between perception and action, a causal link, well, you can have some really structured coordination. We call this sensory coordination or embodiment. Let me be clear, I don't want to say that just the body is important and not the brain, but I would like to put the body in the center. And what the brain is doing is integrating information from all the senses. 
visual information with tactile information, visual information with sound, sound with tactile, and all the combination can be done. What the brain is doing is integrating these uh, different uh, modalities inside specific neurons called mirror neurons. These neurons are quite important and very interesting, but they have some sparse representation, which means uh, partial representation, partial knowledge. They are asynchronous activity. They are distributed. And also they are fuzzy because they, they receive information from the environment and uh, therefore it's uh, not a completely uh, a complete information. This is completely different from von Neumann machines or computers. Computers, for instance, have a full knowledge about their, their uh, representation because they have access to the whole memory. Memory is also digital. They are in binary code, zero, one, and it can, cannot be something between. Also, it's sequential, sequential order of the uh, cycle of the processing. And finally, it's completely clockwise. So you have certain ads, some certain cycle to, to make it. They are completely different kind of cognition. And uh, you might think first, looking at those two, two type of processing, that computers are quite strong. And uh, in fact, our brain is quite stupid or quite lazy. But uh, in fact, uh, the, the distribution inside the brain can be really powerful. So I will explain you why mirror neurons and this association between the different neurons are quite interesting. When you grasp an object, you make some links between your visual activity, your motor activity, and tactile activity. And therefore, the, the mirror neurons are firing when you grasp the object. Now, the really interesting thing found by Rizzolati is that when you see someone else grasping an object, well, the same neurons are firing. So, because uh, it's a quite interesting thing because it's exactly the same neurons that are used for the grasping task and for learning by observation, the observing task. So there is somehow some adaptivity between the two neurons. It's not finished. When you are using a tool, well, you change your way of your representing your own body. The same neurons are used, and, and uh, <laughs> now I have two tools. The same neurons are used for uh, changing the way you represent your own body. And this is really plastic. When you don't use any more the tool, when you readapt re yourself to your own body dynamics. You are doing it all the time in front of your computers. Well, you, you are making some coordination transformation between visual activity and motor activity. The mouse is in one plan while the cursor is in the other plan, like that. So you are doing it completely transparently, dynamically, and you don't think about it anymore. But somehow, you are doing it. And also the same, when, when I do some motion, you can understand quite readily what motion you are doing, what the other person is doing. So by imitation, you can learn also from it. You are linking, for example, when I move my head, hand, you are linking my own motion with your own motion of the hand. But sometimes you make mistakes. You don't understand that when it's my left hand, but you perhaps, you might think that it's your right hand that is moving. So there is some mismatch, there is some adaptivity. But the thing is, uh, well, these neurons are not coded for one task or for all the tasks, but also if there is a new task, a new event, a new situation, the same neuron can bend to the new situation. They are not pre-programmed for one task. The thing is they are just firing to visual, motor, and tactile activity, and also sound. So they are quite interesting to be used in robotics because if you use this kind of ideas, you can make be makes robots more autonomous. To go to that direction, we tried to first to, to make an artificial skin for robots. So at first we have a resistive skin and when we put a weight on it, we change the electrical field on it. 
From this, we are learning a neural network so that the neural network will learn the topology. So we, here is the way we put the, the weights and we are moving. And the topology is on the left side. The neuron is learning the topology. This is the learning stage. First, there is no topology. We don't give the x, y axis on the surface, by, but by experience, by touching it, but the receptive fields are learned by the neural network. Here it's used in multi-touch. And we can do, therefore, some pattern recognition for representing some shapes on it. And once you have learned the tactile activity, and you put on an arm, a robotic arm, you can learn the correspondence between the motor action and the tactile input. So the tactile input is on one side when you are pushing, and the motor is on the other side. Well, what the robot and the neural network is doing is just linking the two. The association is quite simple to do, and the neural network can learn just by binding the two activity. So we were quite excited, and from this, we wanted to go more to the understanding of the mirror neurons. So we try to use now visual activity, and we try to get a neural network that learns at the same time the tactile activity and the visual activity. So in the right part, you have the neural activity for the tactile activity, and the blue part is the visual activity inside the neural system. You can see that when you grasp the object, you have a high burst of activity for the two modalities. And after, when you, re you are taking your, you, the object with, uh, with activity, you can see that there is some high activity for both. The thing is, for the next experiment, we try to do for only one modality with the same neural networks. At the first, we thought that if we give only the visual activity, well, the neural network will give only visual information. But the thing is, if you see the activity in red of the tactile neural activity, even when you grasp the, the object, well, its activity is quite high. In fact, because there is learning inside the system, you are binding the two dynamics, and even if there is only one modality, the visual information serves to reconstruct back the tactile activity. So even if you use only one sense, you use always your all the sense to recreate the missing information. So somehow we replicate back the information or the behavior of uh, mirror neurons. We try to go further to understand how infants are doing this. So we try to model, now for facial recognition, the tactile information on the face. In this, uh, in the, in this, uh, in, this uh, in this figure, in fact, uh, we have tactile information, as you can see here, on the facial, uh, on the facial uh, map of the face, and there is a neural network who is learning, in fact, the topology of the face. So the, the upper part of the face corresponds to, in the neural network, to the blue part. And there is, there is also the topology for the, for the mouth. So the mouth is related in the topology of the neural network in, in, uh, in the red part. And if you look closely, you, there is also a symmetry, the left part of the face and the right part. Uh, there, normally there is an animation, but you can see how it works. We learn by a mesh the topology of the face, and in fact, uh, when you are moving the face, there is some information stretch that, you, that is linked to the neural network. So that the upper part and the lower part of the topology is created. Once the, the tactile information is created, well, we can link it, like previously, with the visual information. So the lower part is the somatosensory map, which is related to the tactile activity, and the higher part, higher level part, is the visual activity. When the two maps are aligned, well, the upper part of the visual signal corresponding to the eyes are linked 
to the upper part of the, two, of the tactile activity. So the two are aligned. But when you have the lower part of the face is linked, therefore, to the lower part of the visual activity. So when the two are aligned, you have in the middle layer a multimodal integration so that you have multi, uh, you have bimodal integration between visual and tactile activity. And when you have a face, well, the system is able to fire just when the face is coming. We did the three dot pattern to show how the system can represent face and can be used for uh, multimodal integration. When there is a three dot completely aligned to a face, facial activity, you can see in the red part that the high activity inside the neural network in the middle layer. So only when there is alignment between the upper part of the visual map and the lower part of the visual map, you have high integration. And slowly, if you make a rotation of the three dots, well, the activity is decreasing. And this is really like this, what we see infants reacting to this kind of pattern. These uh, three layers is in fact a um, model of a superior colliculus. And uh, this is an hypothesis where we are making that fit in during the fetal stage, the fetus are learning these three maps and learning in the superior colliculus, which is a really a small brain area inside your brain, which are binding the different modality with a simple mechanism due to the alignment. The, the thing is, because you have a face, you can use this information from tactile, act information, tactile activity and to remap it inside the visual activity. So you can use one information in one map and use it in another map. Because you have one face, you can recognize other faces. From this, uh, we try to integrate uh, visual, facial expression, and also auditory information. So we did uh, a little robot with uh, some facial expression, some ears, and also in order to learn the vowels. So this is the learning stage. So we did, we use free vowels because infants are learning this quite really. So this is the recognition phase. So we believe that uh, infants are linking information, visual information, tactile information, or proprioceptive information, and also auditory information. And one information is missing, you are reconstructing it or associating it with the other information. Once you get this, well, uh, we have presented several types of robots linked to development. I would like to show you a last video about a snake-like robot. And uh, this, which, this will be the, the last uh, slide, in fact. But the key message that I would like to, sh to tell you is that uh, from this video, but even if it seems a really simple or complex body, look at in the upper right uh, uh, corner is the, is the command. The command, the command of a robot is just on-off signal. Here, the signal is not complicated at all. The complexity comes just from the body. And we can make really human-like or animal-like interesting behavior just by changing a little the controller. Because we are exploiting the dynamics of the body, we have this kind of dynamics. So perhaps you might think that all I have, that I show you is quite simple intelligence, quite low level intelligence, but I really think that if we want to go to mathematics, abstract cognition, causal inference, or grammar, you need to understand all these kind of things. And also, they are deeply rooted to your body dynamics. In fact, 
you can only think about you can perceive. And this is the same for robots. Thank you very much. <laughs>